with you. Thanks so much to Jacob and uh, Dr. Walsh for putting this on. We greatly appreciate it, and it's an honor to be here with you. Um, I need to say two things before I um, get started. One, um, I have dedicated a book to Merrill Westfall. I've dedicated a book to my father, who's in the audience. I'm proud of with me tonight. Um, I've never dedicated a book to my wife, and she reminds me of this a lot. <laughs> um, so since this is being live streamed, I want to say hello to my wife Vanessa and my son Atticus. Um, so it will buy me at least time until the next book, I hope. <laughs> the second thing I want to say is the first time and the only other time I've ever been at Villanova um, was when Jack hosted, I think it was Religion and Postmodernism 4, um, may have been 3, but it, whichever number it was, it was the one where like a hurricane hit and the power was out and the speakers didn't show up and we uh, huddled together in the cafeteria over at the St. Augustine Center, if I remember right, and all leaned in to hear Catherine Keller deliver a talk and Edith Vishagrad ask questions, and it was just fantastic. So it's wonderful to be back with lights and power and um, internet working, I hope. So all kinds of good things. Okay, so the title of my talk tonight is Whose Christianity, Which Postmodernism, Seeking a Theory of Religious Practice? Let me begin with some disclaimers. First, I am not a theologian, and I have no desire to come out as one. Um, but tonight, I will likely sound more like one than I ever have before. And I pray the theologians in the audience will forgive me. Um, the reason I claim not to be a theologian is because I don't think I'm good enough to be one. Second, I'm entirely convinced that philosophy of religion must become less narrowly theistic and specifically Christian. I endorse and support comparative and cross-cultural work that's currently being done across philosophy and theology. And in fact, I'm currently working with colleagues from other religious traditions on a book dealing with cross-cultural religious epistemology right now. However, tonight I'll be working entirely out of my own Christian tradition. Third, I am all for technical debates and philosophical scholarship, but tonight I aim to be just a little bit more personal. Um, in fact, some of the theologically sounding stuff that I'll be saying is precisely due to this personal quality of my talk tonight, but I consider this not as theology and definitely not as pastoral, um, whether in good or bad senses, but I instead take it to be more in line with um, what Merrill described in 1973 as personal philosophy, which was part of what he described as the prophetic approach to philosophy of religion. So that's more where I see what my talk is meant to be in line with and where I'm coming out of for this evening. All right, so having begun, let's begin. I'm a Christian. Well, as Kierkegaard says, I'm trying to become one. And I'm a postmodernist. Well, at least I think I am. Whether I count as a Christian and as a postmodernist all depends on who you ask. Indeed, in many ways, the fact that I identify as a Christian disqualifies me for many as a postmodernist. And the fact that I identify as a postmodernist disqualifies me from many as a Christian. So here's the deal. I am a Pentecostal Christian who is a professional philosopher of religion, and I think that the basic theses of postmodernism are probably true. This complicated identity is not an easy thing to maintain, and I'm not sure I'm even up to it, but I hope that I am. And I think that it matters that I try to live in light of this hope. Tonight, I'm going to do my best to explain why I think this is the case. I'm going to provide an account of what I think is at least one version of what faith in a postmodern age might look like, and it's the version that I find occurring in my own life. I'm increasingly persuaded that offering a philosophical account of the relationship between postmodernism and um, religion, especially Christian faith, must find traction in one's own life. I don't mean this in an egoistic way, such that my own life would now be a case of special pleading, but as an existential one, such that lived existence is the context of meaning for the claims offered regarding postmodernity and religion. Simply put, what Kierkegaard asked about inquiry more generally when he was only 22 years old, we should specifically ask of postmodern philosophy of religion. Let's listen to Kierkegaard. What I really need is to be clear about what I am to do, not what I must know except in the way knowledge must precede all action. What use would it be to be able to propound the meaning of Christianity to explain many separate facts if it had no deeper meaning for myself and for my life? End quote. 
I do hope that in the discussion period and roundtables, we'll have some time to get into the weeds about the finer points of postmodern philosophy. But for the time I have tonight, I'm simply going to lay out for you why I struggle so much in my own life to figure out what faith in a postmodern age should or even can mean on the ground as lived out in practice and in community. I will conclude with just one possible vision of what postmodern Christian faith might involve. Okay, so let me make three points, and then I'm going to invite you to think with me a little bit about them. Point one, as a Christian, I'm frequently told I'm not Christian enough. Point two, as a postmodernist, I'm frequently told I'm not postmodern enough. Point three, the phrase, faith in a postmodern age, which is on the title of tonight's, uh, this weekend's event, it needs a comma. Those are my three points. All right, so about Christianity. A couple weeks ago, I was invited to get some coffee by one of the pastors at the church where my family and I have attended for about two years. It turned out that after a long conversation and a few cups of coffee, there was a very short thing that he wanted to say to me. Here it is. My family should look for another church. He told me <laughs> that I, I, I would say I'd be bad, I feel bad about saying this because he may be listening, but I think the chances of that are so slim <laughs> that I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it. <laughs> He told me that I needed to leave because I was a disruptive influence on the community and that the leadership felt that I was unwilling to come under church discipline and get on board with, in his words, the cause of the church. All right. Two of the most influential thinkers on my own theological identity are the singer and songwriter Rich Mullins and the writer Anne Lamont. In that moment when my pastor told me that I really wasn't welcome to come to his church anymore, I found myself praying one of Anne Lamont's famously favorite prayers. Help me, help me, help me. <laughs> and drawing on the theological depth of one of Rich Mullins' songs, the lyrics of which are, Hold me, Jesus, because I'm shaking like a leaf. You've been king of my glory. Won't you be my prince of peace? Help me. Hold me. In other words, I needed assistance in what I would term standing fast while waiting patiently. Look, I like argument. I love argument. But there, over coffee, my facility with argumentation ran up against an existential limit. It would have been easy for me to have given reasons for why he was wrong about this or that, but the simple fact is that the conception of Christianity with which he was working, and according to which he understands the world, made no room for the questions and beliefs that I find to be inescapable in my own faith life. Such beliefs might include the intractability of the problem of evil, the frustrating reality that petitionary prayer eradicates self-sufficiency, and the difficulties that are affiliated with notions of the hiddenness of God. My questions are significantly simpler, however, and they all basically reduce to one. Why? Why is there suffering? Why is there ignorance that inspires hate? Why is there death? Why is it all just so damn hard? Why? Now, we could formulate a very specific and technical explanation of his rationale for why I had to leave the church along the lines that his theology was not appropriately haunted by the hermeneutic requirements expressed in the play of signifiers operative in his discursive community. And we could even throw in some references to Derrida, Zizek, and Bud Yu for good measure. <clears throat> Which, and I don't, I'm not making light of that. I'm saying we could do this. Like, that's a way to offer a critique of what happened. But basically, here's the thing that matters. My beliefs and my questions challenge not only his certainty, but also his authority. What's most frustrating about the conversation with my pastor, well, I guess I should say former pastor, um, is that he's simply the most recent in an increasingly long line of well-intentioned Christian leaders who have told me that I'm dangerous, disruptive, problematic, threatening, or whatever, to the Christian community. I've been told this by several pastors at some large churches. I've been told this by administrators and faculty at some very prestigious Christian universities. And I really don't want to mention any names, but one of those universities might be a favorite institution of the actor Will Wheaton. It's funny, though. I don't feel dangerous. I don't mean to be disruptive. I don't want to be threatening. Intentionally trying to be such things seems to me to be more about egoism than truth-seeking. Indeed, I just think conversations matter and that we should pay close attention to the fact that Jesus is frequently interruptive of the certainties by which we operate. So my questions arise out of my faith and not in opposition to it. 
with Anne Lamont, Rich Mullins, St. Augustine, Soren Kierkegaard, Gianni Vattimo, the Roman soldier, and probably many of you, I frequently say, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Moreover, specifically as an open theist who, divine, who affirms divine personalism, I continue to think that God responds to our confusion and questions similar to how God is presented in Isaiah 41. Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. So, as I see it, my beliefs and my questions are not threatening to Christianity, but motivated by Christianity. Appeals to deconstructive phenomenology and radical hermeneutics are not required for such beliefs and questions, though they are likely to be extremely helpful for framing the questions and getting clear on what is at stake in those beliefs. That said, just a brief look at the Hebrew Bible in the New Testament conveys that questions, uncertainty, and longing are part of religious life, not a threat to it. Moses doubts God at the end of Exodus 5. Romans 4 claims that Abraham hoped against hope. Job gets angry at God. Habakkuk even accuses God of not acting in the name of justice. Further, you don't have to go to the excellent books by John Schellenberg to wrestle with the hiddenness of God. Just go to the Psalms, where God is said quite often to hide the divine face from those who seek it. Finally, when it comes to my basic question, why, I find myself in a long tradition that includes the authors of Job, Psalms, Lamentations, and Habakkuk in asking, how long, O Lord? Help me. Hold me. These are profoundly religious prayers. They do not reflect a failure of faith, but a trust in God. Again, I'm a Pentecostal. There's not a whole lot of us that go to conferences like this. I don't understand myself as an enemy of orthodoxy, in the sense that's given to that term by G.K. Chesterton. I tend to identify with much of what C.S. Lewis means when he talks about mere Christianity. I consider myself to fit, in many ways, with what Tony Campolo describes as red-letter Christians. But I can express such proximity while still being quite worried about the rationalism of Chesterton, the apologetics of Lewis, and the specifics of Campolo's politics. Alternatively, I'm not very sympathetic to some of the trends in radical orthodoxy. I know this was shock, Jack, but <clears throat> I'm not sympathetic to a lot of these trends. But I'm very sympathetic to others. I'm on record as thinking that religion with religion is probably a better option for postmodern philosophy of religion than religion without religion. But I can express such hesitation while still being committed to the inescapability of hermeneutics, the necessity of embodied perspective for all inquiry, the centrality of hospitality to ethical life, and the importance of critique as a mode of discursive rationality. Ultimately, though, despite being someone who plays at the edges of what I take to be at least an historical center of Christianity, I cling to that center as definitive upon the, of the edge upon which I stand. This is why I'm entirely fine with being a challenge to the certainty and the authority of my former pastor. And yet, in this sense, Christianity itself is why church is hard for me. Let me be clear, it's really hard. I do wish my former pastor would realize that I can be helpful for reminding the church community that the Bible might represent the greatest temptation to idolatry available for evangelicals. I wish my former pastor would celebrate that asking critical questions can help the church to be maximally oriented towards those who would otherwise be overlooked. In other words, the widow, the orphan, and the stranger stand as constant challenges to the triumphalist tendencies of Christian complacency especially when that complacency is underwritten by political allegiances that seem to make religious existence more about reinforcing a reliable voting bloc than being interrupted by grace. Indeed, perhaps neither the road to Emmaus nor the road to Damascus lead to our contemporary churches. But this is not what my former pastor did. And yet, that he didn't do this makes complete sense given his particular conception of Christianity. As such, I do not think he's irrational or unreasonable or immoral, but just mistaken, and very regrettably so. Ultimately, I don't agree with him about this conception of Christianity, but I do continue to hope that such disagreement can find a place within the contemporary Christian community, as it certainly does in the scriptures to which Christians appeal. That said, if Christianity simply means what it means to my former pastor, then I'm not sure that I can consider myself a Christian, and I'm quite confident that I don't want to try to become one. In a song entitled, Your Redneck Past, 
Ben Folds writes the following. I'm from Chattanooga, Tennessee. So this is actually just outside in Cleveland, Tennessee. Here's Ben Folds. If you're afraid they might discover your redneck past, there are a hundred ways to cover your redneck past. Just find a place where no one knows of your redneck past. Yeah, you can easily dispose of your redneck past. You'll show them all back home. This is Islam. I expect that many of you, especially if you're trying to work through or get over or forget your own generally Christian, or in, more specifically in my case, your evangelical past, you might quickly say that church is hard because it's a bad idea and should rightly be abandoned. Kind of like Ben Folds sort of encourages about one's redneck past. In the spirit of Peter Rollins, maybe the points to explore the fidelity of betrayal. Perhaps the best way to get over an evangelical past is to break ties with evangelicals. Perhaps the best way to offer criticism to the church is to stop going. This response is entirely plausible to me. And accordingly, if I'm looking for a place where no one is interested in my evangelical past, then it seems to me that a postmodern philosophy religion conference seems like a great option. We are here to talk about the end of religion, after all. Well, even though I understand why many in this situation have left the church in order to make possible some version of postmodern Christianity that makes sense to them, I simply can't trade in Christian community for postmodern colleagues, despite the fact that I usually want to. Importantly, just as it is my Christianity that ultimately compels me to challenge the version of Christianity represented by my former pastor, similarly, I can't leave the church not despite my postmodern identity, but precisely because of it. In regards to point two, here's some thoughts on postmodernism. Postmodern philosophers of religion talk a lot about the end of things. I'm interested in interrogating the necessity of thinking about the end of religion as a way of beginning a conversation about the possibilities of faith in a postmodern age. Must the one end in order that the other begin? Here we might find something of a postmodern John the Baptist saying that one's participation in Christian community must decrease so that one's postmodern faith might increase. Reinforcing my own sense that we philosophers must get more personal, I think that sometimes postmodern philosophy of religion can miss the forest for the trees, or the faith for the discussion about faith. For my part, I think that we postmodern philosophers of religion far too often engage in complicated questions of interpretation in order to remain a step removed from the difficulty of sincere commitment operating internal to a life of religious practice. It's kind of like when writing your dissertation, you convince yourself that instead of writing today, what you really need to do is read some more. <laughs> Engaging in hermeneutics is obviously essential for thinking and living well, but sometimes hermeneutic existence can invite a second order life that can fail to find traction in what Wittgenstein would call the rough ground of a community of discourse defined by sheer hope, belief, and ritual. This is not an either-or here, but simply a Kierkegaardian reminder not to forget about living while we think about best how to live. Postmodernism should propel us into our historical communities, not away from them. It should call us to critical engagement, not disregard and detachment. By the way, we should resist confusing postmodern with a term like continental here since many philosophers not working in broadly continental traditions are nevertheless thoroughly postmodern in their approach to inquiry and existence. So for me, William Alston and Nicholas Wolterstiff say, are postmodernists too. That said, what then should we mean by postmodernism, and specifically the notion of a postmodern age? Well, for Kierkegaard, an age not only marks a historical epoch, but a subjective orientation that is written into a social norm such that the subjectivity itself is at stake. <clears throat> what would the postmodern age then mean as concerns identity formation as claimed to be properly oriented as a result of a particular social location? Well, as with Christianity, a lot depends on who you ask. We could continue for a long time formulating a even longer list of folks to read in order to get a better sense of what postmodern is and what is at stake within it. And this is often, I think, the favored strategy of scholars working in this area. And I don't think, again, it's like an intentional attempt to avoid. I think it's because we try to make clear, well, this is the history in which we find ourselves. However, regardless of how long a list we develop and how many names we pile up, 
I think that Merrill Westfall's account of postmodernism is still perhaps the best definition I've seen for summarizing what minimally underlies all of these various foci and emphases. For Westfall, postmodernism is simply the idea that, as he says, you can't peek over God's shoulder. Notice in this definition, Westfall does not assume any sort of theism, but simply uses the notion of God's shoulder as a rhetorical shorthand for objectivity. His phrasing, though, is powerful in light of Nietzsche's proclamation of the death of God and Vatimo's extensive account of how the death of God is necessarily connected both to the fulfillment of Christianity and the increasing secularization or <clears throat> the desacralization, as Jeff talked about, of postmodern society. Tweaking Westfall's definition of it, I would simply say that postmodernism for me is the view that it is highly doubtful, probably impossible, that we can ever see things without occupying a perspective, which is at the same time subjective and socially located. That's what postmodernism means for me. Said slightly more technically, I think postmodernism is probably necessarily opposed to access internalism when it comes to justification. In other words, you have access to the reasons that then justify the beliefs that you hold. But it is entirely open to metaphysical realism and even correspondence theories of truth as understood according to a generally epistemic anti-realist outlook. There are, of course, a wide variety of realisms and anti-realism. I once heard a paper about like, the variety of realisms and another paper on the variety of naturalisms, and there's like 17 of them and stuff. <clears throat> there's a lot. But in broad strokes, we might say that if God's vantage point has historically been synonymous with the idea of seeing things sub spake attorney, then saying that we can't peek over God's shoulder suggests that, as Kierkegaard says, quote, existence is a system for God, but not for any existing individual, end quote. Even if we correct Kierkegaard's statement and say that he should have said existence might be a system for God, since it is not clear for me, at least, where we would stand to say that it is this way for God, even then, we're still left with the messiness of historical existence as a living in a world and a living toward social ends. Notice also that when Westfall says we can't peek over God's shoulder, his choice of the term peek indicates, rightly it seems to me, that we would have to sneak to take a look because we probably shouldn't be standing there. My son's currently reading this, like, you know, learn to read book, and it has a lot about sneak, a peek, and take a look, and all these terms. And for me, I, I was trying to explain to him why this is just, this is great, this is Westphalian postmodernism. It, 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 it work. <laughs> so we've got to sneak a look. We've got to sneak around God's to, to look over God's shoulder. In other words, there's something wrong or maybe even disobedient with our attempt to occupy such a non-perspective for existing individuals. Assuming objectivity is not just bad epistemologically, it's bad morally. In this sense, then, for postmodernism, epistemology immediately opens onto ethics, or said slightly more theologically, and echoing much of Jean-Luc Mampillon's work, to forget our fallenness and finitude is not only to display intellectual arrogance, but probably to engage in idolatry. Here we stand, peering through a glass darkly. Ultimately, there are two things that I take to be true about postmodernism. First, postmodernism is necessarily a reminder of some important things about us as inquirers. We are finite, limited, embodied, historical, fragile, and often vicious. Second, postmodernism does not necessarily say anything about reality or God, except as those claims are indexed to inquirational locations. Now, putting these two points together, we can see that a postmodern age, then, is one that should be guided by epistemic humility, but not necessarily by any specific theological doctrine or metaphysical account, or lack thereof. Drawing on the above Kierkegaardian emphasis, then, I'm going to refer to this general view of postmodernism to which I subscribe as Kierkegaardian postmodernism. This basic insight of Kierkegaardian postmodernism as concerns the possibilities of faith in a postmodern age is that we must take seriously where we find ourselves and realize that all God talk is said by someone while located within a community. This is what my former pastor was unwilling to admit about his own appropriation of Christianity. Namely, that it is his, and it's located in a very specific interpretive history shared by his community. The realization that perspectivalist inquiry is probable, <clears throat> excuse me, it's probably inescapable, has led, though, to a rather stark division in the philosophical and theological communities and in, in the debates in which those of us engage in these play. On the one hand, 
There are those who have resisted postmodernism and say that if we're stuck within our own perspectives, this should motivate us to cling fast to divine revelation that ruptures and reorients such perspectives towards the objective truth. So let's call this the objectivist solution to Kierkegaardian postmodernism. The objectivist solution does not necessarily reject perspectivalism for human knowing, though it often does, but it merely retains a thick conception of epistemic realism as a result of divine revelation. We can know things as God knows them, and we can know that we know them. Why? Because God reveals such knowledge to us. Accordingly, even if we never escape our own perspectives, God allows us to know absolute truth with a capital T within those perspectives. Sometimes I've referred to this general view as operating according to what I term a cataphatic orthodoxy. Insofar as the claims to determinacy are held with near epistemic certainty, such that those who would reject the claims are then labeled as irrational, unreasonable, and probably immoral. On the other hand, so that's the objectivist solution. On the other hand, there are those who do embrace postmodernism and then go on to say that since we can't escape our perspectives, we should stop acting like there's some truth with a capital T beyond them. Let's term this the subjectivist solution. On this account, the reason we can't peek over God's shoulders is because there's no shoulder over which we can peek. All truth and revelation is lowercase. According to the subjectivist solution, postmodernism does entail metaphysical and theological claims, but nearly always in deflationary or negative ways. Accordingly, I sometimes have referred to this general view as operating according to an apophatic orthodoxy. Now, with these two possible solutions to the potential problems that perspectivalism presents, <laughs> that is a lot of P words, sorry about that sentence, I find myself unable to affirm either option. Simply put, if the subjective solution is taken as entailed by postmodernism itself, then I'm not a postmodernist. Alternatively, if the objective solution is presented as necessary for Christian philosophers, then I'm going to have trouble considering myself a Christian philosopher. But there's a third option, and probably like 17 others. But at least a third. Here it is. According to the Kierkegaardian postmodernism that I endorse, aspects of the subjective solution are not necessarily entailed, and aspects of the objective solution are not entirely rejected. Instead, both are options depending on what else one is willing to grant and what other bullets one is willing to bite. For me, my version of postmodernism pulls me toward the subjectivist solution, but my version of Christianity pulls me toward the objectivist solution. Must I choose absolutely? I don't think so. For postmodern philosophers of religion, revelation with a capital R and truth with a capital T are both possible, but only as lived. That is, as interpreted, affirmed, put into practice, etc. Here we're able to maintain the postmodern resistance to access internalism, but maintain the possibility of a realist view of truth. This is a postmodernism with which I can get on board because it does not require me to check my particular existential bags at the door, but instead allows me to bring my context, my community, my commitments, and my convictions with me, but then to realize that they are never protected from critical scrutiny. Again, I don't think you need postmodernism for that, but it certainly helps. So let's conclude by talking about the importance of commas. Derrida has a book about ellipses, so I figure commas are <laughs> open for discussion. Let me summarize what I've said up to this point. Christianity and postmodernism are both difficult because they are not singular conceptions. Religious belief, like philosophical theories, are always someone's, but that someone is always located in a community in which such theories and beliefs are either legitimated or contested. It's easy to remove yourself from that contestation and occupy spaces of legitimation, right, just with a different community. But I've claimed that both Christianity and postmodernism recommend tarrying with the challenge rather than fleeing from it. How then do we stand fast while waiting patiently? How do we welcome the criticism while serving the community? How do we integrate, excuse me, how do we integrate without resolving the tension that is constitutive for Christian and postmodern subjectivity? These are very hard questions. I don't have good answers for them because I think that they are only truly answerable by undertaking them as Kierkegaard would say, a task for a lifetime. As Anne Lamont says, she seeks grace, comma, eventually. And Derrida says, we must engage in learning to live, comma, finally. Help.
me. Hold me. I know that some postmodern Christian philosophers like being dangerous, but I don't. I think that Christianity is dangerous enough. Similarly, some postmodern philosophers like being radical, but I don't. I think postmodernism is radical enough without having to up the ante at every turn. Ultimately, I don't think that postmodern faith requires an end of religion. I think it just requires that religion be allowed to be as dangerous as, as it already is. So for me, I'm an, I am uninterested in, quote, faith in a postmodern age, whereby the object of my faith ultimately ends up looking like postmodernism itself. Rather, I want faith, comma, in a postmodern age, such that the quest is now how do we be faithful where we are as postmodernists. In, such, in other words, faith is not made more radical in postmodernism, but postmodernism is the historical site in which we find ourselves wrestling with the radicality of faith. Christianity and Kierkegaardian postmodernism can work together to reinforce this comma. How so? Well, I want to try to answer this question somewhat performatively by concluding with one possible vision. So I don't want that purity that Jeff is worried about. I'm with him on being very resistant to that. But here's one vision of how to think of faith, comma, in a postmodern age. This is an account that's consistent both with my postmodernism and with my Christianity and constantly destabilized by both. Here's the thought. It's simple. Either God is trouble or God is nothing. For me, postmodern Christian faith is encapsulated in this exclusive disjunction. Too often, God is presented as the authorizer of the way things are supposed to be. God is like the ultimate mismanners, though in the evangelical tradition it's going to be a Mr. Manners, for all the reasons that Jeff, I thought, very nicely explained. These manners are usually taught by churches and Christian schools that claim to stand for Christian truth or Christian morality. Yet allowing God to function as something like the enforcer of the way things should be all too often reduces God to mere reinforcement of the way things happen to be for us within our communities. As David Foster Wallace reminds us in This Is Water, the best way of discouraging thought about something is to claim that it's obviously true and so not in need of any thought. As he says, don't forget, this is water. This is water. Again, I think that the risk to my former pastor was not only regarding his certainty, but his authority. If God just stands as the ultimate hammer with which to smash objections and criticism of the way that Christians do things, as those former pastors and college administrators seem to indicate, then God really is nothing. By nothing, I don't mean that God doesn't exist, but simply that it no longer matters if God does. If God is basically a rubber stamp for our own conceptions for pious living, then why do we need the stamp in the first place? If there were no God, then we would still likely live this way because there's some power or benefit to us within our community for doing so. God's names are frequently invoked to underwrite public policy, church practice, and social discipline, and all too often serve to justify the exclusion of those who don't fit with what is obviously the way God wants things. If God is an excuse for complacency, then God is nothing. We can be complacent quite easily without divine aid. <laughs> if God justifies the way things are because they happen to fit the way that a particular group thinks they should be, then God is nothing. Those folks will likely keep thinking the same thing as long as it benefits them to do so. C.S. Lewis said a lot of smart things, and one of the smartest is when he claimed that very rarely does stupidity become wisdom because we associate God with it. Such association, he thinks, would just make us look dumb and God unnecessary. <laughs> I think he's right. God is trouble for anyone who would think that the obvious for Christianity simply is <laughs> obvious. God is trouble for anyone who would assume that Christian ethics is easily identified with a particular political orientation. God is trouble for those who would expect God to be safe to the way they already think. Here's another smart thing that C.S. Lewis said. Aslan is not a tame lion. In other words, God is trouble for anyone who thinks they have God figured out. 
Just ask Job as he faces the whirlwind, having lost everything. Just ask Stephen as he sees heaven open as the rocks rain down upon him. Ask Abraham as he hears God's voice just before plunging the knife into his son. Ask Mary as she follows God's command and goes to tell Joseph. Ask the adulterous woman as she looks up and sees her accusers have gone and Jesus remains. I'm not appealing to these narratives as evidence for the truth of my account. That's why I don't think I'm doing theology, by the way. But rather as narratives that illuminate the way that the texts of the Christian tradition serve to destabilize the complacency that so often operates in the Christian tradition. How then is faith, comma, in a postmodern age possible? As lived, as embodied, as shared, but as disruptive, as challenging, as destabilizing. Postmodern faith does not require an end of religion. But it does require the end of thinking that philosophy is the proper criterion by which faith should be judged. In this way, the subjectivist solution to the perspectivalism of Kierkegaardian postmodernism might be more ontotheological in the bad sense, not the radical sense, than classical theism ever was. So we move forward as Christians and postmodernists with existential confidence and yet epistemic humility. Here I stand as Dietrich Bonhoeffer rightly says, but I can always do otherwise. Hence the risk, hence the trust, hence the faith, comma, in a postmodern age. This is what Help me, hold me. So let me end with another favorite prayer by Anne Lamont. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Questions? I guess what the panel says, questions. This will be very quick. Is it not the case that the two prayers of Anne Lamott are in fact presented as a single prayer? And that the prayer is to say, thank you, thank you, thank you, help, help, help. Thank you, thank you, thank you, help, help, help. Yeah. And this is for me the oscillation. Um, that radical theology wants to present, but I'm then trying to say, look, I'm with the oscillation, but the oscillation occurs internal to my Christian personalist account of the divine. She has a book that just came out where she says her three favorite prayers, she's added one. <laughs> Help me, thank you, wow. And I think that wow is also pretty fantastic because that's where the mystery of the divine shows up. But not in a sort of skeptical theist view like analytic theology often will present, but in, I think, a deconstructive, radical way. A wow in the sense of, like Levinas means when he says, when I engage the face of the other, I can't predict what the other's going to say. This is terrifying. For me, and I've elaborated on this elsewhere, part of why I cling to a personalist account of the divine is because I actually think God might laugh at us. So the risk of singing in the shower, for me, pretty low. The risk of singing in front of people, you notice I didn't sing the Rich Mullen lyrics? <laughs> like, that would be all bad. It's because y'all would laugh at me. So part of why I think risk, trust, disruption, help me, help me, thank you, wow, is part of, for me, why I stay internal to the tradition which I have found myself religiously rather than saying that postmodernism causes me to jump ship. Questions? I'll ask one. <clears throat> Many of us in the room have experienced the sort of alienation you're talking about, the sort of pushing out. Um, and our response in some cases has been fairly negative, the hiding the way is done with it. How do you expect to find, scale of one to ten, you find a congregation, a community that will embrace that sort of twin narrative you've got? Yeah, um, and, and notice, um, it, I, I wanted to make very clear <laughs> that though I disagree with my former pastor, I don't think he is irrational or immoral. Now, I disagree rapidly with some of the ethics that are deployed in the community, right? So I think that the realities by which those are then deployed in communities more largely are immoral. But I'm trying to make very clear that he, as a representative of a view that is legitimated and coherent in the community, is not something then that we should just say, I want nothing to do with this. Right? I'm trying to keep him as an interlocutor, if that makes sense. Right? He, too, is that widow, the orphan, the stranger for we postmodern philosophers. Right? It's his eyes here. 
That said, <clears throat> I want to make sure that I similarly don't make it look like those who have engaged this sort of alienation, this ostracization, this marginalization at the hand of the church, whether it be for you know, being intellectuals, right, which is more kind of where I find myself, or whether it be for identity categories themselves, right, because you're gay or because you find yourself, you know, embracing communism as a better social vision, right? Whatever the reason that you've experienced that kind of authorization, I'm also wanting to say it is entirely reasonable to me that one would say, I want nothing more to do with this, right? So I'm going to make that very clear. I'm not at all saying, here's the right way to go. I'm saying, this is where I find myself. Right? And we can talk, we can do philosophy about, well, is there arguments for that? Is it maybe a better way? I don't even want to commit to that, though. So all that to say, how scaled 1 to 10? I don't know. Um, I will say I have found it in various times in my life. But those various times are where, again, remember I said at one point that how we catch this stuff out is going to depend on what else we're willing to commit to and what other bullets we're willing to bite. So, for example, I once decided that it was not okay, one of those times where a church was asking me to leave, and I decided, you know what, if I'm going to leave, it's not okay to me that the segregation that occurs every Sunday morning, usually at about 11 a.m., continues in my own life. And so my wife and I decided that we were going to look for an African-American Pentecostal community. They welcomed us with open arms. And it was interesting there, though, because socially and politically, there were a lot more points of allegiance. <clears throat> Theologically, relative to specifics internal to my own version, it were actually less identity. <clears throat> but it was a community that welcomed us without any problem. It wasn't an issue. Right? The pastor and I had coffee many times. <clears throat> I've also been at churches that to anyone else would seem like the very kind of conservative evangelical community that I'm worried about. And yet the pastor would be so aware and reflective and critically engaged that he and I would have, for example, in this one case, such a deep personal relationship that built from our critiquing and challenging each other that in some sense existing in that community became easy for me. But it became easy because my conversation partner was maintained, even internal to a community that then didn't see me as disruptive. Right. So, so I'm, I'm not at all saying this is a, a wash across the board. I will say I no longer, I don't think, um, use the term evangelical as a self-description. But that doesn't mean that I then am not an evangelical. I know Rachel Held Evans, I think, last week like, said she's no longer an evangelical. Or something. I don't want to do that. <clears throat> I'd rather talk about my evangelical past, hence the Benfolds, and my Pentecostal identity. Right? For me, that's how I make sense of where I find myself. I'll let you pass the mic now. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, nice I just wonder if uh, the way you, you, you seem to be using postmodern seems to cast the net a little too broad. <laughs> so, I mean, John Locke, you know, denies the category of essence as being useful and says this is kind of just idle talk. And that seems to be, well, if essence is kind of integral to achieving objectivity, then John, is John Locke a postmodernist? And then, you know, he could say similar things about David Hume and Immanuel Kant, but the problem is, like, if those guys aren't modern, then I don't know who is, I, you know? Do you, you understand the question? Oh, absolutely, I do. Um, I get it a lot, and I think it's a good question. Um, I, I would, I'd make two distinctions. One is I think it's important, for me at least, that modernism and postmodernism um, can be cashed out in, in a bunch of different ways. So, and I usually thought, I actually had a whole section in the paper that I dropped because I thought it was getting too technical and I was trying hard to keep it all generally at the same spot. <clears throat> There's also a line where I say, you, we could go on with a bunch of names about how to add it up. I actually had like a page where I did that. I thought, well, I can't make fun of myself, right? So I dropped it a second. <clears throat> but one way to catch out modernism and postmodernism is to think of this as somehow historically identified. So we say, well, here are these great examples of this historical epic period move, whatever. And here are these other great examples. And so we've got to figure out, well, what is it that makes sense of the fact that they're in two different spaces? <clears throat> I'm not a historian of philosophy, um, though I hope that my philosophy is historically you know, right. And I, I read that work because I want to make sure I'm not saying false things. But I'm not a historian of philosophy. And so 
<clears throat> I, I'm more interested, when I use the term postmodernism, I'm thinking of a philosophical view, a, a, a position that one could say in a truth table, <laughs> true or false. And so for me, um, postmodernism, I have no problem if Shakespeare's a postmodernist or if Augustine's a postmodernist. I think Jack's actually made a compelling case that Augustine might be in, in various ways. So I have no problem with this sort of historical wideness that happens. I'm more worried about a different version of the net to <laughs> it is simply this. Those very objectivists that I talked about, the objectivist solution to Kierkegaardian postmodernism says, hey, even if we're perspective, even if we're perspectival, God ruptures this, gives us absolute truth, right? Some sort of census divinitatis or something like this, right? Um, here's my worry. As long as you're a fallibilist about your truth claim, it looks like you could fit my definition of postmodernism. <laughs> so if William Lane Craig, say, who's or Richard Swinburne, right, great examples of what I would consider the objectivist solution people, if they simply say, of course we could be wrong, then don't they count as a postmodernist? And here's where I'm going to say, yeah, I don't think so. Because <clears throat> I'm building a lot into when I say it says stuff about us as inquirers, about our embodied finitude, vicious, right? All of these things that I'm now drawing on particular moves in virtue of epistemology to say our viciousness actually affects our epistemic capacities. Our embodiedness, our embodiment is precisely where people like Catherine Malibu and many others are giving us, Judith Butler, etc., giving us really good reasons to think. Embodiment has really interesting realities relative to how it is we hold truth claims to be true. So that's where I would start saying I don't think it's too wide a net. But I will grant all day long, it is a wider net than some other versions of postmodernism in play. And my worry about those wider versions, or excuse me, those narrower versions, is that what they end up doing is necessarily inscribing a metaphysics or a, a, a theology in ways that I'm saying, well, look, maybe that's what postmodernism really is, but then I'm not a postmodernist. Right? So if I'm, I'm fine writing that bullet. So I'm trying to sketch why I think it's a word worth fighting for. Zizek says that fundamentalism is, is so bad that Christian legacy has to be wedded, you know, like pulled back from fundamentalists. It's too important to let them have it. I, I actually want to say that about postmodernism. The postmodernism is such a useful heuristic and hermeneutic tool for thinking well about things like faith and action and morality and virtue and politics and critique. It, it's too important then to let it be so narrow that it then entails particular views on all of those things. That's where, for me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand with, with confidence and then say, I could be very much wrong about this.